Having losers in your portfolio sucks and not knowing to do with them, should you keep them and wait a little bit longer? Maybe they're gonna go back up, maybe they're gonna recover, but maybe not. So over the past two weeks, I asked you which loser you struggle with in your portfolio and today I'm going to review eight of them. Dividend Growth Investors, bonjour, my name is Mike Yehu and I am the founder of Dividend Stocks Rock and I also host this YouTube channel to help you invest with more conviction so you can enjoy your retirement. And you cannot really enjoy your retirement if you keep wondering what's gonna happen with your stocks in your portfolio. And every time that you open your brokerage account, you see that red line showing you how bad that investment decision was. And today, you're still not sure what to do with it. So I'm gonna cover eight stocks, telling you a little bit of the story and what, should I, what, what would I do with this one in my portfolio. Obviously, those are not buy or sell recommendation. Keep in mind that I am not in your shoes. I don't know your investor's profile. I don't know your financial situation. So you cannot help me liable for my choices. I'm just giving you some thoughts to reflect on. So let's get started with a famous, very popular loser that we had like everybody, no, not everybody, but a lot of people had in their portfolio and it's Algonquin Power and Utilities, ticker AQN on the US side or AQN.to. Uh, this one was a holding in my portfolio last year. I suffered the drop, I suffered a dividend cut and spoiler alert, I already told you that, but I sold my shares of Algonquin upon the dividend cut that happened in earlier of 2023. So what's the story behind it? Well, first, Algonquin has impressed a lot of investors throughout the years. They had an aggressive growth by acquisition strategy. It was working well because they were using a lot of variable debt plus issuing a lot of shares to generate more cash flow to buy those utilities. One, they were buying utilities, they were transforming them into renewable utilities to generate even more money and benefit from the subsidies from the government. So that work, and they went from roughly 100,000 clients to over a million over the span of 10 years while increasing their dividend every single year. So everybody thought, you know what, that's great. At the Before the old collapse happened, they had 65% of their business on their regulated utilities, so predictable cash flow, very easy to understand and to predict, and then 35 from renewable assets. Unfortunately, in 22, we had interest rates rising very quickly. Since 24% of their debt was issued on floating rates, meaning variable rates, so whenever the interest rates go up, they have to pay more, they got squeezed. They issued so many shares in the past. Before that, it was not a source of concern because they were able to generate more funds from operation per share. So as long as they're able to win that race and increase their dividend, there were no, any, there were no problems. Going forward, they had more problems, they struggled, and now they're in a place where revenue is gonna plateau, earnings per share are quite shaky, and they decided to cut their dividends, sell some assets. My guess is they're trying to maintain their credit ratings because if they lose confidence that are given by the credit agencies, the stock price is gonna fall even more because then they will have to pay higher interest rate on their new debts. Uh, on this one, I've lost faith because they broke a very important rule, which is I sell upon a dividend cut. Of course I sell and then the stock is roughly like 25, 30% higher than when I sold. But in the end, what would it take to Algonquin to get back to 2020, 2021 level? Well, it's gonna take some growth. It's gonna take a balance sheet that is a lot more under control, which is not happening right now. It will need a clear plan because right now it's still not it's still not sure what's gonna happen with the sales of the assets. They wanna sell for $1 billion of assets, but nothing is really clear. It's still a little bit foggy. So for those reasons, I decided to move away and move on and focus on another stock. Keep in mind, I knew that Algonquin was a riskier play than Fortis, for example, so it was not a large part of my portfolio. So I took the hit, I sold, I moved the money elsewhere, and then end of the story for me. Moving on to a REIT, Northwest Healthcare Property Real Estate Investment Trust, nwh.un.to. Uh, 
I will tell you up front, I'm not a big fan of healthcare properties REITs. Why? Because over the past three years, they saw their expenses going up and their occupation rate going lower. So in other words, more expenses, lower revenue, well, it doesn't sound a good thing, right? So no dividend increase over the past five years. So already I can see that there's a business model that is struggling. And on top of that, there's no dividend growth. So for this one, I would not even go into it. So today I would sell it and move on. The problem here is yes, you have demographic on your side because obviously we have a, an aging population and this is the same rationality for all the Canadian but also the US healthcare REITs such as Omega Healthcare for example. So if you have in your portfolio I would answer the same way OHI. The problem is right now the demographic is on their side but the occupation rate is not that high because we have an oversupply um, versus the demand that there there is and the other thing is since that expenses are higher it gets very difficult for them to grow and generate more funds from operation per share on top of that all REITs have been affected also so it's a sector thing on top of like an industry thing all rates have suffered from higher interest rates because all their mortgages will be will become a burden going forward and as you can see for those who hoped that interest rate would go down in 23 well it's not gonna happen and maybe it's not even gonna happen in 24 so those REITs or capital intensive companies with larger amount of debt will have to deal with that for more than six months Moving on to TELUS, which this one is probably a loser if you bought it in 22, but besides that, you're probably making money on it. Um, but as you can see on the dividend triangle, you see a nice revenue growth, but for the earnings per share, it's not that great, right? So how can you explain that revenues are growing steadily, dividend is growing steadily as well. TELUS is known to increase its dividend twice a year for an average of like six to 7% per year, which is quite generous. Even the last one was roughly 3%. So we can see that they're still on target with their dividend growth rate policy. The revenue is growing, but the earnings are going anywhere. And then the stock price is declining. The, the, the yield is above the average of the past five years. It's now offering more than 5%, which is kind of crazy. It's pretty rare that you're going to see that from TELUS. So a lot of people are starting to wonder like what's going on. And if you look at the classic payout ratio, you're going to, be very surprised to see that they're over 100%. Well, the thing is, over the past five years, Dallas has massively invested in wireless infrastructure. So we're talking about the maintenance of infrastructure, increasing spectrum, and also obviously investing in 5G technology. Those investments are now going to slow down a little bit, and then we can see that the cash flow generating, generated by the operations is increasing. So while they have increased their level of debt throughout that period, now we're reaching this plateau where TELUS should shift from make like having more debts to invest in their projects to getting those projects generating enough cash flow to pay off the debts and continue the dividend increase. The fact that the revenue and the dividend continue to increase is um, very good sign and if you look at the cash flow situation it's improving over the past recent quarters so i definitely think that this one is an interesting buy at this point i do have it in my portfolio in full disclaimer and i am keeping it that is for sure now let's go on the u.s side for a few stocks so realty income a classic REIT has been increasing its dividend every quarter which is kind of cool right and then once a year you can see that there's a small like a bigger bump every time so we you can expect like two three percent a year of dividend increase it's not much but it's enough to keep you going um revenue and ffo per share seems to be pretty much healthy they're still growing so while the stock is going down and or stagnating for the past three years i haven't get back to pre-pandemic level well here's the thing as interest rate rose, it, it had two impact on the REIT sector. The first one is obvious. The mortgage on properties becomes a, a bigger burden because interest ex expenses will increase, as I explained earlier. But the other thing is a lot of income-seeking investors 
decided to sell their bonds and their GICs over the past 10 years and move towards uh, safer and predictable uh, di dividend paying companies such as rates and utilities. Now that interest rates are higher up, those same investors, they're looking at realty income and they're looking at those juicy yields on the GIC and they're just like, you know what, I'm going back to safety. So there's less demand for those type of industries, those type of sectors. So this means also that the stock price will stagnate a little bit. Doesn't mean that the business is, is bad. It just means that right now people don't want rates that much in their portfolio. However, if you look at the long term perspective, they have built a Great business model, will sing in tenant, triple net lease, um, very clean, uh, straightforward way to do business as a REIT. And it's it has been working for several years and it's gonna continue to work for several years as, as well because they focus more on the location than having those large shopping malls that could be quite expensive and it could be hard to fill completely. With smaller single tenants, it's gonna be a lot easier for them to continue to thrive in the future. Now we have a very interesting one with Innovative Industrial Properties, IIPR, that rose patient. Um, I was very interested in this interested in this one a few years ago. I thought, you know, as you can see, the dividend triangle is still very, very strong with revenue FFO per share continuing to increase all the time. Now we have hit a plateau since uh, 2002, so no increase of the dividend in 23 so far. Maybe we're gonna have a small one, but before that, it was like every quarter we had an increase. So what happened? Well, this one grew very quickly and it was probably too fast and too good to be true. And at one point, the problem is when it started to go down, I thought, oh, here's an interesting opportunity. So maybe we can look at this one. But I was really like, oh, this is probably a speculative play. You have to be careful with this one, but still showed a really good, interesting play. Fast forward to today, it's been now a year and a half that the stock is going down and the same concerns are still there. The problem is the business is rolling, but then, and as you can see, the numbers are still good, but tenants are struggling. So innovative industrial property, they offer um, industrial properties for cannabis license operators. So they're not cultivating the cannabis, they leave that to the operators that are all licensed. So it's for medical purposes. Um, they're growing because more states in the in the US are approving this, uh, this product. But the problem is those tenants are still having problems. Um, they are not able to make to pay their rent. The rent collection started to go down a little bit at the beginning of 23. Now it has like, stabilized. But one thing that is a source of concern for me is that they're using deposits of, of security. So yeah, there was like cash available. So they're making their, their, their rent payment like this. But eventually that, that cash reserve is gonna run out and those tenants will not have their deposits of security anymore, their security deposit. And going forward, what's gonna happen? If they were not able to pay the rent for one or two months and now the security deposit is gone, what's gonna happen on the third month? So I'm not convinced we're gonna have a great summer and a great fall for IIPR. I still treat it as a speculative play, probably like one, in this video that is the hardest to make up your mind around it because it could be a very strong play if those tenants starts to pay back their rent because then the stock price will will go back up because the numbers are still good right now but on the other side the market doesn't believe that and they're a little bit more concerned and, and convinced that what's going to happen is we're going to have more and more tenants not being able to pay their rents, leaving and then leaving IIPR with empty, great facilities, but empty nonetheless. So this one, proceed with caution. Just make sure that you don't have a large exposure on this one if you wanna hold on and see what's gonna happen. I think that this story will close one way or another by the end of the year because for those tenants, they will not be able to make up and try to make arrangement and find money forever. So that as a short, short term play here for the next six months we'll have the story on uh, that will evolve and probably close by the end of this year 
So here's an interesting one with Walgreen Boot Alliance. Uh, used to be a very interesting and very uh, popular holding among my American friends. I mean, we're talking, we're thinking about Walgreens. It's all about drugstores. They cover so much ground in the U.S. And with the COVID, we thought, well, with all the vaccines going on, that should go well. But here's the thing: as you can see at the dividend triangle. Revenue still plateau for the past five years, no growth here, and earnings are actually slowing down, so it's even got worse. And then when you look at a combination of stagnating revenue, slowing earnings per share, and what's going to happen with the dividend growth? Slowing down big time. So five years ago, 10 years ago was a great stock today. Definitely, this business is struggling. Strike the retail is um, the retail business is tough. Lots of competition. They need to invest a lot in their stores to make them appealing, do promotions and so on. It's not helping. And at this point, I don't see it come back from Walgreen. I think it's going to take forever for it to come back. And because of the high level of competition, I don't see the dividend growth to continue because margins are going to maintain to be squeezed. The earnings per share are not looking good. Uh, so I would get rid of this one and move my money elsewhere, definitely. So the only non-dividend paying stock I decided to cover in this video is Walt Disney, ticker DIS. Mostly because I have it in my portfolio, mostly because Bob Eager is back and he said, we're going to reinstate the dividend. And also I wanted to explain why I kept it when they suspended their dividend in 2020 due to the pandemic. So I have a hard rule where every time I have a company cutting down their dividend, I sell and I get rid of it as soon as possible and I just move on. I don't want to keep those losing in my portfolio. It hurt my mind, it hurt my emotion, and it's there's no point of keeping those. I mean, they've been losers, they failed their promises, and it's time to find another dividend grower instead. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often in my portfolio, but this one I decided to keep because it's not their fault that the world decided to shut down and then they were not able to operate. So no more movies and movie theaters, no more park theme opening. So where could they go, right? So it, because their business was thriving before COVID, I decided to hold on to it in my portfolio. In 21, I looked like a genius because the stock price increased big time. The market was super hyped about the streaming industry being developed. Now Walt Disney is number two behind Netflix. It didn't take that much time, so that was very positive. The problem, they're not making much money out of it. Actually, they're burning cash, and that is a source of concern. So the movie theaters is back in, in business. They're doing a great, great job. Park theme also, they've, they have proven that they have strong pricing power and inflation is not a problem, but they are buried in with because of their, their streaming service where it costs so much to operate. So Bob Eager came back, decided to clean that up, trying to cut it on expenses, make it more profitable. You can see that revenue now is going back on the uptrend, but as long as the dividend will remain this way, it's going to be hard. So this one, you'll have to remain patient um, if you want to get your money back. I believe it's going to happen because Disney didn't lose any of its major characteristic. It's still the emperor of content. They have a the largest library of characters, stories, and content on top. So like you have like cartoons, but you also have all the Pixar's movies, Marvel, and, uh, and Star Wars. They have infinite amount of things that they can develop with the Fox assets. Now they're back in on track with Avatar they will continue to generate a lot of content. From that content, you can get movies, you can get TV series, you'll get more people uh, paying for streaming services for that reason, more people coming to park themes as well, and more apparel, toys, and all the derivative uh, products coming from those stories and movies that will be sold across the world. On top of that, Bob Eager said, we're going to reinstate the dividend by the end of 23. So obviously this one, I'm keeping it this year. If there's no dividend by the end of the year, I'm gonna sell it. Uh, that will be too bad, but I need to stick with my strategy. And at one point you need to draw a line. So I have Walt Disney and CAE that suspended their dividend back then. Today, I'm looking at them like, you know what, you have until the end of the year. If you don't pay a dividend, you're out of my portfolio and then I'm gonna move on. 
Funny thing is, for CAE, I'm actually making money on that trade. So it's not about selling a loser, it's about selling a stock that does not fit within your investment strategy because your investment strategy is a lot more important than a one individual stock. And the last but not the least, Brookfield Renewable. Uh, this one is interesting because it trades on both markets, so Canadian and US, BEP or BEPC. So you have corporate class shares or uh, trust slash partnership units in the US or in Canada. So if you want to avoid all tax problems, you go with BEPC and then you're all good. It treats uh, it trades like a regular stock. So as you can see, dividend is growing. Expectation is like five to 7% per year. Uh, you can also go back in time or look in the description. I do have a full video on the Brookfield family and I have a Brookfield report as well to understand how each part works. This one, you can see earnings and revenue are going up, so there's not necessarily a problem here. So everything seems to be interesting. It's not perfect, but it's growing. But the stock price is declining. So what's going on here? Well, it is more a sector thing than anything else. As I mentioned earlier, REITs and utilities has been affected by higher interest rates. So a lot of dividend income seeking investors, they're leaving those sectors to go back to bonds and GICs. And this is one of the major reasons why Brookfield is down. The second reason is all renewable stocks are not getting much love since mid-21. Uh, there was a big hype and before 21, everybody wanted to invest in renewable energy. Now, after that, we saw that the classic oil and gas industry made a big hype, big jump. Everybody saw, oh, you know what? The oil barrel is going to go back to 150 bucks or 200 bucks a year. Don't worry, it's going to always, at least, worst case scenario, never go down below 100 bucks. I had that story many times, to be honest. And then, well, after summer of 22, oil barrels started to decline. People said, wait until winter, it's gonna come back up. Now they're saying, wait until summer, it's gonna come back up. And guess what? We're still not at 150 bucks a barrel. Uh, so it's not, it hasn't pushed investors going back to renewable energy so far, but this is pretty much the dynamic here. Don't forget that Brookfield Renewable is one of the largest renewable utility available on the market. Half of their uh, business is generated from hydroelectricity. The other half is spread across wind and solar electric generation. They're investing massively every year. And they're also backed by Brookfield Corporation, the parent company. So they have plenty of liquidity. They can increase their dividend without any problems, but it is investing in patient asset so you need to be very patient you need to have a long-term strategy so if you want these stocks to thrive in the next three years maybe you're going to be very disappointed on my side i do have brookfield corporation in my portfolio it is not a winner it's not a large user but it's not a winner but i'm still going to keep it um, if you want to have more idea on how to manage your losers and how to manage your portfolio, I created a complete workbook. I called it the DSR recession proof workbook because yes, I believe we're going to get into a recession. So it's important to clean up your portfolio, establish a clear and simple investment strategy and stick to it. So this workbook will help you doing those three phases and you're just going to feel more confident about your investment. You will sleep well at night and then you can move on with your life and enjoy it because that's the whole purpose of investing, right? We want to make money so we don't have to worry about anything. Well, there you go. This workbook, the link description is right below. It is for you. So, all right, that's enough for today. Next week, I'm going to share with you three tricks to avoid dividend cutters in your portfolio. And until then, don't forget to stay invested.